All right, Judges chapter number five is really a continuation from chapter number four. Uh, if you're here last week, we saw basically the entire story of um, Sisera leading the battle, and um, he was the captain of the host for the for the wicked king of Canaan, and um, Barak and Deborah. Deborah was the one judging Israel at that time. And Barak was supposed to be the, you know, the leader, the general of the army. And um, we went over a lot of things last week. And some of the, some of the same topics are going to kind of carry over. And I covered a lot about, you know, women's roles in leadership, how Deborah was a prophetess, but she was also the judge, and kind of what the Bible talks about on, on both of those subjects. I'm not going to re-preach any of that tonight. But we saw all the events that happened last week. And I didn't get too much into detail preaching at the end of chapter 4 where it talks about Jael, Heber's wife, who, uh, who ended up killing Sisera. And she's the one who gets the honor for that whole victory in that, in that battle, basically, at least humanly speaking. Of course, God always gets the glory and the honor. And even in this, this is no different. We're going to see that God's the one who did the fighting for them. God's the one who gave them the great victory. God's the one who told Barak to go out and fight. But because he had such a wimpy heart and not willing to go out and do it and, and relying on Deborah to go out with him and, you know, just not listening completely to the word of the Lord and just trusting in God, the honor was removed from him who, who would have normally gotten the honor. I mean, the general, the commander, the one who's, who's going out and leading armies in the victory, they're the ones that normally will get the, the honor of, of winning a battle in war. But he didn't. Because Sisera, who was the, the leader there, you know, the, 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 the opposing force captain, ended up being killed by jail by a woman in her tent. So she's the one who got the, the, the honor for the, the battle. And we saw that prophesied in chapter 4. But then in chapter 5, this is after they get the victory, after they win. It starts off in verse number 1. It says, Then sang Deborah and Barak the song, the, excuse me, the son of Abinoam on that day, saying... And it continues on here with this whole song of just rejoicing and kind of recapping the story and going over uh, what happened in a song. It says, Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. And we're going to get into this in just a little bit, how it says this is a general statement that the people willingly offered themselves. We're going to see that not all the people willingly offered themselves. You know, overall, it was great. You know, the people kind of came together and they fought this great fight and, and had this great victory. But we're going to see it mentioned some specific tribes by name and kind of mentioned they didn't really do that much and their heart wasn't completely in it. Verse number three says, Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes. I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchedst out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. The clouds also dropped water. The mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through byways. And I think what this is saying in verse 7 says, the inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. And what this is saying is, you know, it's a little bit going over how the children of Israel were oppressed here in verses 6 and 7. It says, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied. So like the main thoroughfare, the main way of traveling where you think of, if, if uh, things are going well in a city, you're going to have a lot of traveling, going back and forth, going through the highways. You have a lot of, a lot of um, trade and traffic going back and forth. But it says here that the, the highways were basically unoccupied and the travelers walked through the byways. So they kind of went through the paths less trodden, right? And, and I don't want to say snuck around, but, you know, that it wasn't, I think there was a lot of fear is what this is indicating and they were under oppression, so they weren't just, just walking boldly out in the open. They were kind of taking the byways. And it says the, the inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel. 
until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. Because they were under oppression, they needed someone to lead and to free them, and God did send a deliverer. Verse number eight, they chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? So they didn't even have good weapons. They didn't have weapons of warfare. That's what it says. Did you even see a shield or a spear among 40,000 in Israel? Verse number nine. My heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. Speak ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way. They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. Verse number 12, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, utter a song, arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. And if that phrase sounds familiar, leading your captivity captive, that is something that's found a few, just a couple times in Scripture. And we're going to turn to two references for this. Psalm 68. There's a couple other references, but we're not going to get into all of them because they're not all necessarily pertinent to what we're going to cover. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I just want to make sure that people understand what this phrase means. It's actually a very simple phrase. But I think a lot of times um, people get confused by this and false doctrine is preached as a result, even though it ultimately isn't, it shouldn't be. It's, not, it's definitely not a difficult concept to understand. But um, we're going to read Psalm 68 and then Ephesians chapter 4 is probably the most famous usage of, of this uh, leading captivity captive about the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 68, verse 17 says, The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai in the holy place. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Now, what I think is a kind of interesting about this is that it's bringing up these references of, um, you know, Mount Sinai, of course, is where God delivered the Ten Commandments unto Moses and where the children of Israel wandered around in the wilderness, but God met with them in Sinai. And this event basically is also referenced in Judges chapter 5 earlier. I kind of skipped through a lot of it, but... Um, When it talks about verse number, in verse number four and five, Lord, thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchedst out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped, the clouds also dropped water, the mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. And, and it's bringing up this reference to Sinai again. And I think this is all just a foreshadowing of, uh, you know, this leading captivity captive is just this, just bringing, throwing this out there of what's going to happen ultimately with Jesus Christ coming to the earth to lead captivity captive. And all that means, so you think of captivity. The children of Israel were in captivity. Basically what you're doing is you're turning the tables. You're taken from being under captivity of being under bondage and then coming in and, and now you're the one in control and you're going to lead that, you're going to take that captivity and you're going to take that hostage. You're going to take that captive and lead that away, right? So the way that Barak here led thy captivity captive is because they were under bondage. They were in captivity in the land of Canaan. He rose up, you know, defeated the enemy and put them into captivity. So he's leading their own captivity captive and, and, and getting rid of it. And of course, if you turn to Ephesians chapter 4, and Psalm 68 is just another foreshadowing and reference about how God, you know, God has 20,000, you know, the chariots of God are 20,000. Even thousands of angels, the Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Thou hast ascended up on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Another foreshadowing of God coming down to lead captivity captive. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 7, the Bible reads, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. 
Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And this is the ultimate victory. This is the ultimate victory over sin, over death, and of hell, which is also why it mentions, hey, what is it, you know, it, it gives us the detail that when Christ ascended up on high, that's when he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men, right? What is the captivity? The captivity is of, of hell, death and hell. You know, oh, grave, where is thy sting? You know, uh, death, where is thy sting? Grave is where is thy victory? He, he conquered death and hell. And that's why it continues on and says, because where did he ascend up from? It wasn't just from the grave. He ascended up from hell. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? The whole point of that, you know, the, the resurrection, what, what's such a great victory with that resurrection is not only the bodily resurrection of Christ, but the fact that he rose up out of the pits of hell and that he truly, you know, he, he suffered and died and paid for our sins in hell and ended up leading that captivity captive. So we don't have to worry about being captive in hell forever or at all. Not for a thousand years, not for 10 minutes. Not for two seconds. We never have to worry about the captivity of hell. Jesus took that captivity captive when he arose from the dead, when he came up out of the grave, when he came up out of the pit, and he ascended up into heaven, and, and now is sitting on the right hand of God the Father. Amen. And what we see here, now that's the ultimate victory. right? But here in Judges chapter 5, it's a, it's a much smaller scale but it's a similar concept of them being made free um, and, and coming out of captivity. So let's go back to Judges chapter 5. I just wanted to go over that real quickly and just kind of give a little bit, share a little bit more light on Ephesians chapter 4. People have all kinds of weird ideas about what that means, but it's not a difficult concept at all about leading captivity captive. I've heard some strange things, but um, I'm not going to get into all that and debunking that because I think it's a pretty straightforward verse. Uh, in and of itself. But let's keep reading here. Judges uh, chapter 5, verse number 13. Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among thy people, out of Maker came down governors, and out of Zebulun they that handle the pen of the writer. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Now, in verses 13 here through 15, we see um, after taking captivity captive, now they've subdued the land. He made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. So the mighty rulers that were ruling at that time, now they're ruling over them. The children of Israel are ruling over those great leaders and those nobles. It says, Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among that people out of Maker came down governors. So these are out of the different tribes of Israel. You have leaders now rising up, these governors. Out of Zebulun, they that handle the pen of the writer. Um, and then it's, it's saying how Issachar was with Deborah and they were there on foot they, in the valley. They were fighting. And it says for the divisions of Reuben, there were, there were great thoughts of heart. And then it keeps uh, going here, verse 16. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flock? So this is talking about the divisions within Reuben. Not all of Reuben was, was there to help in the fight. Saying, why, why were you, basically, why were you out in the pasture, out in the field, just with the sheep during a time of war, during a time when the Lord and the children of Israel needed you most, and you're just going about your business and just staying out with the sheep out in the field? Like, where were you? Where is your heart? Why is there divisions 
uh, 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 great thoughts of the heart. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Look at verse 17. Gilead abode beyond Jordan, and why did Dan remain in ships? Dan's another tribe just being called out. Where, where were you at the, at, the, at the battle? Why weren't you fighting? Why are you just out in the ships? Why are you, Reuben, why are you just out in the, among the sheep? Why is Dan remaining in the ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. They're just doing their day-to-day -day life. Hey, there's a, there's a battle being fought. There's captivity being led captive. Where are you being a part of that? They're just off doing their own thing. And we're going to see that, you know, there's a reason why they're being called out. This is a big deal in the sight of the Lord. Verse 18, but then we get to Zebulun and Naphtali. It says, Zebulun and Naphtali were people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. Zebulun and Naphtali, they stood up. They were there in the fight. They're going to get honored and recognized here. Now, um, let's jump down real quick to verse number 23. The Bible says, Curse ye Miraz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. So when it came time for the bell, the angel of the Lord saying, you know what, curse that city. Curse these people when they're not going to come up and fight in the day that the Lord needs you to fight. And we need to, to remember this, yes, you know, as the children of God, and, and in, this, in this scenario, they're all children of Israel. They're all God's chosen people, right? But some of them chose to fight and some of them didn't. And those that chose not to fight, God is angry with them. And to the point of here, with the city of Miraz, he's saying, curse Miraz. Where were you? Why didn't you get up and fight? And you know, the Christian life is a, is a long battle. It's a fight. It's a struggle. You've got multiple fights going on. One, you've got the daily fight against your flesh. You've got the spirit and you've got your flesh. And your flesh every single day is going to be telling you, don't do what's right. Take it easy. Relax. Just do whatever feels good. Oh, you're kind of uncomfortable. Don't listen to the spirit. It's raining outside. Don't go out soul winning. You're tired. Don't worry about reading your Bible. That's what the flesh is saying. But you know what? There's a fight. We need to step it up. We need to walk in the spirit. But then there's also the fight out there, of course, of just the, the overwhelming fight of evil in this world. The spiritual wickedness in high places and the, and the, the, the ways of Satan, our adversary, are out there that we need to fight against also. And we can't just sit back, just live our life, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That is a wasted, meaningless life that, yeah, if you're saved, you're going to heaven, but that's about all you're doing. You're not going to reap any rewards. You're, not gonna, you're, you're definitely not going to do what God wanted you to do. And, you know, I say this, you know, it makes God angry. When you've got a born-again child of God, who chooses not to do anything for the Lord. I think it makes God angry. You know, and so many people like to think like, oh yeah, you know, I got this great relationship with God. You know, I show up to church or whatever. Look at what Jesus Christ did. Do you remember the story of the fig tree when he came on, when he was hungry and it was the time of fruit and he came up to the fig tree and it wasn't producing any fruit. There's no fruit found on it. What did he say? He cursed the tree and it withered up and died. Now the tree, it was a fig tree. It was definitely a fig tree. There's no mistake. And it, was, it, it, was, it wasn't some other type of tree. It wasn't some evil tree that brought forth thorns and briars. It was a fig tree. But you know what? That fig tree wasn't producing any fruit. And when Jesus came to that fig tree expecting to see fruit because that's why it's there, the purpose is to bring forth fruit. Wasn't bringing any fruit. Let's take it away. Let's get rid of it. And there's other examples in Scripture as well that have the similar type of teaching to it. You know, we said, hey, what does the Lord of Vineyard do? We got, you know, we've got, the, we've got these, uh, this orchard. It's not, it's not bringing forth fruit. We've got this tree. It's not bringing forth fruit. Well, here's what we should do. Let's dig about it. Let's dung it. 
and, and let's give it one more chance. And then if, it, if it's not bringing forth fruit, let's get rid of it. God has us here as born again believers to bring forth much fruit. Here it is my father glorified that you bring forth much fruit. That is our job. He's given you the best gift that anyone could ever ask for, and you didn't have to work for it at all. He's bestowed that upon you because He loves you, and He wants you to be saved, and He wants you to have eternal life and to be with Him, and He gets all the glory and honor and recognition. But you know what? It's kind of insulting once you take that free gift. Not that you have to earn it, or not that you have to pay God back, but to just be so selfish and self-centered to just say, well, thanks, God. I'm not going to tell anyone else about this great gift and how they could be saved from an eternity in hell. And I'm just going to go off and just do whatever I want to do. Thanks for that great gift. And you're basically spitting in his face when you decide not to do anything for the Lord that saved you, for the Lord that bought you with a price, with a precious price. And yeah, I, you know, I think that makes God angry. I do. I know as a father, humanly speaking, it would make me angry if I give the, the most I could possibly give for any one of them and they just treat it like it's nothing, like it's no big deal. Well, I'll tell you what, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross was not nothing. That was everything. Everything. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is an immense gift. That is precious. What are you doing with that gift? We got saved. Yeah, amen. And I'll be glad to see you in heaven. But let's go about to, to do those things which please our Father in heaven. Let's bring forth much fruit. And, and we see in many instances, this is just one small example. And this is, this is a very small, you, this isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think about God you know, being angry when people don't get involved and get in the fight and, and step up and, and do, you know. This is just kind of a side note. But it's found, that concept is found all throughout Scripture. Even in the little stories like this, just in, just in one verse, verse 23, Curse ye Miraz, said the angel of the Lord, Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord. To the help of the Lord against the mighty. Now notice it also didn't say they didn't come to the help of Barak. It doesn't say they didn't come to the help of Deborah. Now humanly speaking, they, were, they may have been leading the charge. But it wasn't about Barak and it wasn't about Deborah. It's about doing what's right for the Lord. And, you know, in this fight, we ought to be able to put aside personalities. We ought to be able to put aside, you know, who this person is or who that person is. If we're in the fight, we're in the same battle and we're believers and there's other believers, we ought to be able to just say, hey, I'm going to join the fight, too. And I'm not just going to say, oh, well, I don't like Deborah. And I don't like Barak. So I'm just going to stay out of it altogether. No, because if, the, if it's a battle of the Lord, you're not going there to support the Lord by staying out of the fight. It says, they came not to help, to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. God expects us to help. Let's keep reading here. Just go back to verse number 19. The Bible says, the kings came and fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan and Taanach by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. And I think what we're seeing here is this is showing us that God really was doing the fighting and he uses his angels oftentimes to do the fighting. So when it's referring to the stars in their courses, it's not talking about the literal burning ball, you know, star that's out in the universe. What, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a reference to the angels of heaven, to the host of heaven, to the, to the host of the angels. They're coming down and fighting for us. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The river of Kaishan swept them away. So again, God using, 
you know, his forces, they call it the forces of nature. It's not nature, it's a force of God to defeat this enemy. The river at Kaishan swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kaishan. O oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Then were the horse hooves broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. And then, of course, we read verse 23, Kersi Miraz. See, God's the one doing all this fighting, but then people decide not to show up. And you know what? We can't get lazy and slack and just think, oh, well, God's just going to do it all anyways. God's just going to do it. So what am I, I going to do? God will just do it. And this is the attitude that people have. Oh, well, if God wants someone to get saved, they'll just get saved anyways. God will just send someone to do it. He'll just make sure it happens. No. Just because God has promised to fight battles for us doesn't mean that it's not your job to still go out and participate and get in the fight yourself. Because that's what God demands of you. If he didn't, then he wouldn't be getting angry when you don't do it. Verse 24, Blessed above women shall jail the wife of Heber the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. He asked water, and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer, she smote Sisera. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. Now, this one story, there's, there's quite a few things that I think we could learn from this. And um, this is why I didn't spend too much time on it last week. But we get a few more details than we did last week in chapter 4. Now, if we remember in chapter 4, Sisera came in, he basically, he fled on foot. Or he left his chariot when they were being defeated in battle. He ran away. And he came to, you know, the, the dwelling place of the Kenites. The Kenites were, had affinity with, with Sisera and with, and with, you know, the king of Canaan. They were basically, uh, um, they had no problems with each other, right? So when he approaches here, the wife of Heber, Heber actually had affinity with Sisera. Like he was, he would have been a... Uh, um, Wow, my, my brain is not working that well today. Just, uh, just uh, compassionate towards him. He, you know, he would have been a friend to him. Right? An ally. Thank you. Simple words like that. It's not, not coming to mind. He was allied with him. So here he is. He thinks he's coming into safety. Right? He's running away. He finds um, jail. And jail is like, oh, hey, come here. Right? Come on in to my tent. I'll hide you. Basically, now, I'm summarizing here. Don't, don't quote me on this. Is, you know. she, she tells him to come in the tent, and she gives him a mantle. She gives him something to kind of cover himself. He can lay down. And you know, he's just been fighting and battling. And you know, fighting in a war is hard. I've never done it. Okay, I've never, I've never fought in any wars. I've shot a gun many times, but I've never shot at somebody. And uh, even that, though, I mean, think of the shooting a weapon. And, and that itself is still a lot of work. I mean, soldiers go out to war and they have all this gear on and stuff and they, and they hike and stuff. But it's still not the same as like fighting a battle with like swords and other weapons of war that, that you're literally like, like swinging your arm around and stuff. And oftentimes what you'll see as well in these battles You'll see time after time again, they're marching all night in order to get to the place and set up camp, and then they're fighting, and they're fighting all day, and, you know, and it's, it's a grueling event. And you see that many times, the people, what, what the, these, these soldiers and men of war are going through, and it's easy to read over that stuff, but you just take a minute to think about being out in the elements, because in a war... It could be raining, and that's what I said here. You know, there's the, the, the river of Kaishan, and, that, and that's one of the ways that God was defeating these armies. But, like, they're just out in the elements. They're struggling. They're fighting. They're fighting for their lives. So when Sisera finally comes into the tent, he's tired, right? He's exhausted, and he's thirsty. He was just fighting these battles. 
So Eve just asks for some water, and Jael takes him in. She, you know, she, I'm going to cover you. I'm going to, I'm going to protect you. She says, if any man comes here looking for me, tell him I'm not here. Right? She's like, don't worry about it. You're safe here. So just that full feeling of of safety and security. Going in, he, she, he asks for water. She gives him milk and butter and a lordly dish. And, and, you know, he lays down and he's fast asleep from being all worn out. And then she softly comes up to him, takes a nail, boom, kills him. Didn't even see what was coming. No idea. Now, there's a couple things I want to teach just on this one story. Because the way that the Bible words this, I think there's, there's, there's a few main points or, or concepts we can learn from this. Verse 25, it says, He asked water and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. The way that's phrased, it's there for a reason. Like, why do we even need to, why do we care that she gave him butter and, and even what type of dish she served it on, Right? That should draw your attention, like, what in the world? Why, why is this even a detail that, that's given to us? Well, what she's doing is she's providing him with things. And you've and you got to remember, we are so used to being extremely blessed in the society we live in today. God has abundantly blessed the United States of America specifically. And that, you know, there are blessings. We are still riding on the blessings of what other people before us have done for the Lord. Definitely. No doubt about that. So some of the, the examples that we see in Scripture, I, I think we don't always appreciate the, the weight of them, especially when it comes to things like, so you, you'll see all throughout Scripture references to wine, and wine makes the heart glad and stuff, and people will mock what I believe or what we believe that, you know, when the Bible talks about wine, sometimes it's referring to an alcoholic beverage and sometimes it's not. And when people mock you, say, oh, look, it's such a big deal to get a, gl a glass of juice. Like that's going to make your heart merry because they think that the only thing the Bible could possibly be talking about, about wine making your heart merry is, is oh, you're getting drunk or you're drinking booze, Right. That's wicked. You know, if you're going to be looking, if you're thinking that the Bible is referring to drinking alcohol is just making your heart merry, that's not right. Getting intoxicated, there's nothing good about that or, or, or a blessing about getting intoxicated or getting tipsy. Getting a glass of juice. I love drinking juice, first of all. But you got to remember, it's easy for us today, and it's relatively inexpensive today, to go off and get whatever kind of juice you want with the supermarkets and with just the wealth of the nation that we live in. It's not thought of as much of anything these days. You get your own pre-packed little bottle of juice just ready for you to go. That's not the way things have always been. And the reason why it's such a luxury to have juice is because if you've ever done any juicing yourself, you realize it takes a lot of fruit to get a little bit of juice. So if you're getting grape juice, right, you have to be pounding and squeezing and mashing so many grapes just to give yourself a small glass of juice. We, uh, my wife and I, we used to get oranges all the time from her grandmother's house. Her grandmother had a bunch of orange trees, so we would go and pick them and take them, and we'd get these big laundry baskets full of oranges. But, you know, when you start squeezing it, it's like one orange gives you, like, almost nothing. I mean, you have to be going through orange after orange. And we would sit there all day, cut them and have and using machines to do it, let alone trying to use another, you know, a hand tool to do all the squeezing and pressing and juicing. I mean, we had, we had electric machines, plug it into the wall, put it on, and it's spinning for you. It takes a lot of work and effort and a lot of fruit to do it. It's, it's, it's almost like a waste. I mean, you think of all the nutritional value you can get just by eating a piece of fruit, and, and that'll satisfy you and fill you. And then you think of, well, 
you know, it takes 20 oranges or whatever, and, I, and, and I'm not going to have the numbers right, but it's, it's, a, it's a large number just to get one glass, just to satisfy you with one glass versus, I mean, you're never going to eat 20 oranges in one sitting, right? So when you juice things, that is a sign and a symbol of luxury. So when you're able to get something like that, yeah, that's going to, that's great, right? That's awesome because, let's face it, I mean, orange juice is great. I love drinking it. It's, it's, a, it's a very good drink to have outside of just regular water. Um, butter, same thing. Butter is something that, you know, in order to get butter, you need a lot of milk, right? Well, milk is a commodity that is, in, you know, and again, without having all the, the means of transportation and, and all the supermarkets and everything else, you know, you're going to be limited supply of milk. And in order to, to, to churn the milk and to make the butter and separate, you know, and I don't even, I'm not even familiar with the entire process, but I know that there's a lot of things that, um, I don't want to say it's waste, but, but there's only a little bit of milk that you, or a little bit of butter that you get out of a lot of milk. So both of these things are, are um, referenced here uh, as being luxurious, you know, uh, fancy things that she's that she's given him and then on top of it all it's in a lordly dish right so it's it's all presented really you know the finest of everything given to him in a lordly dish and one of the things I think that this story symbolizes or represents is I would say that jail could represent Satan now again this is just a teaching it's a it's a it's an application Jael herself was a godly woman. The Bible is very clear to, to state that, right? But this is the way that Satan operates because what did she do? She enticed Sisera to come in with promises of safety, security. Oh, here's all this stuff. Here's this juice. Here's this butter. You know, he was only looking for water. No, no, no. I'll, I'll protect you. I'll secure you. Come on in. I won't tell anyone where you are. You're safe here. Oh, here. Have this butter, have this milk. And then swift destruction. Didn't even know what hit him. I think this symbolizes the way that sin is and the way that Satan works in our life. Satan is the great deceiver. Satan is out there trying to, to pretty things up and to deceive you into doing something that's going to that's gonna end up costing you your life. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And Satan is, is constantly trying to get you to get involved in sin because sin's going to kill you. And there's many ways that, that he'll use to try to dress up sin. Just as he, you know, presenting you stuff on a lordly dish. You know, it could be with booze. Oh, look at how great this is. And, and nowadays with the... With the mass media and the movies and TV and stuff, there's different images you can project and give you a false idea, a false sense of, oh, this is going to be fun. Oh, this is going to be cool. Oh, this is, you know, everyone's doing it or whatever, right? Whatever means that's just a facade. It's fake. It's not real. Because the reality of it is it's going to destroy you. It's going to kill you. And we see here, you know, at, at just as Cicero went into this place that he thought was going to be safe, he was deceived. It, wa it wasn't a place of safety for him. Uh, she, he ended up just instantly dying. Now, um, when you think about Cicero, right, and it's kinda, this kind of makes, it, it, the, this analogy is putting things... Um, in a different perspective, think about Cicero as being a godly man, right? If we're going to say that Jael is, is picturing Satan, well, Cicero is out fighting, right? He's out in the battle, and he's gotten weary and worn, and he wants to just, well, I think I'm going to quit fighting for a while and go in and take a break and get some rest, and we see um, what happened to that. I think getting out of the fight and getting some rest, enjoying what the world has to offer is one of the allures of sins, especially for people who are involved in a church that's doing a lot of work. Because you can get weary. 
There's a lot to do. And when you start, uh, you know, in a church like ours, we've got all these challenges, right? And we're going to be pushing you. And the goal is to push you to, to strive to be better and better and to do more work for the Lord. Because we know that we, are, we walk by faith, not by sight. We know that in the end, God's going to reward us for our good works. We know that what we're doing really matters. We know that there's a great impact that we could have in people's lives and that we need to be selfless and not just be thinking about ourselves, but be esteeming others better than ourselves. And there's so many reasons to be going out and, and fighting the fight and loving other people and caring about other people that there's a lot of work to be done. And because of the amount of work that needs to be done, it can be tiring. It can be draining. And your flesh is going to be nagging at you to just stop. Just stop. Just get out of it. You know, things were way more fun before you got involved in that church. Let's just go back to having a good time. That's what your flesh is going to be telling you. And you might be in the middle of a fight now, but you're going to spot that tent. And man, that tent is just going to look appealing. That's going to look good. And you might have a pretty young woman going, come on in. I'll keep you safe. I'll protect you. Come on in. I've got milk and cookies. <laughs> I've, got, I've got some nice things for you, right? Just, just come on in. Uh, indulge yourself for a little bit. You, you deserve it. You've been out fighting. Come on in and indulge. Don't worry about that battle. Don't worry about that fight. It's a losing fight anyways. Come on in. Putting the guard down. Going in. Quitting the fight. Going to sleep. You know, the Bible says that we're children of the day. We ought to, you know, we're children of the light. We ought to walk as children of light in the daytime and that we shouldn't be asleep like, like the children of, of darkness and children of the night, that, that we should be um, walking as children of light. The Bible, turn, if you would, also real quick to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter number 6. Because we, we do, we have this big, this fight going on. Internally and externally. Internally with our flesh and just externally in, in all that we do to, uh, to do the work of the Lord. Galatians chapter 6 verse number 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. This is just a little bit of encouragement saying, you know what? You're doing good. Let's not be weary in that well-doing. Stay with it. Get strengthened. You know, you may feel kind of weak. You may feel like, man, we're doing so much. Don't get weary because you can keep your mind on the prize. Keep focused on the end result to help keep you pushed just a little bit more, a little bit further. In the grand scheme of things, this life is, is a, not even a drop in the bucket for the amount of years that you have to spend on this earth right now before Jesus Christ comes back. What, the Bible says, what is our life? It's but a vapor, which appeareth for, for a time and then it vanishes. It's, it's, it's here today, gone tomorrow. And the older you get, the more you, this really hits home and the more you realize it. So I hope the younger people can listen up and, and try to gain this wisdom without having to gain it through experience. The younger you are, you make that decision earlier in life rather than later of using your time wisely and not just blowing it on, on all the vain things that the world has to offer but focus on the things that really matter and decide to dedicate your life to serving the Lord, there is going to be great reaping in the end. But you have to just retain the faith and keep that vision in your mind 
One day it's all going to be worth it. It's all going to be worth it. And along the way it's worth it. When you impact people's lives, when you change the course of a person's life, that is worth it, my friends. It truly is a true saying. It says, you know, it's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And when you can go out and be a blessing unto others, both the lost and the saved, when you bring the lost to Christ, that is a great blessing. That is awesome to be a part of that, an honor and a privilege and a great blessing that you should be able to receive and feel the rewards of that right here, let alone the rewards that God's going to give you at the judgment seat of Christ. But not only just the, bringing the loss of Christ, but what about other believers in Christ that you could help out along the way? That you could maybe, you know, reach out to someone who's struggling with sin and get them back on the right path. Or someone who's down, someone who's about ready to quit the fight, and you can encourage them to stick it out a little bit longer. All of those things are great things. People come to crossroads in their lives where they end up making decisions, where, where it comes a point to just make a decision. And that's why we need one another in the church to be there, to edify, to comfort, to encourage one another, to help people from not making the wrong decision, from not getting out of the fight. Stay with it. Stay the course. Keep your eye on the prize. In due season we shall reap if we faint not. Let's make sure we don't faint. Let's not stray towards that tent. Let's not go off into the world and just say, forget all this. Because when, when you do that, you're liable to just lose it all. Then, I mean, obviously not your salvation, but, you know, I mean, God could just take your life from you. And let's not lose any of the rewards either. Sisera didn't even see it coming. It didn't even take that long either for him to go in there and then just boom, dead. I mean, he was asleep. No idea. He woke up dead, right? <laughs> didn't wake up at all. He went to sleep and didn't even get up. So that's, enough, that's an interesting um, take on this passage. I, th I think that uh, there's definitely some truth there and wisdom we could get from this, uh, from this story. But an, another lesson that I think we can learn is that we see Jael as a wife of someone who's on the wrong side. Heber the Kenite was, was friends with, with the enemy of the Lord. But she chose to do what's right. And there's, there's ways, and we see, I think, women, and women are, are kind of the focus of chapter 4 and 5. And we see women making the best that they can out of the situation that they're in. Deborah shouldn't have been the judge of Israel, but she was because of a lack of leadership. You know, in her view, she's, she's trying to be a mother to Israel. She's trying to protect and help out. But she wasn't trying to be the father. She was just trying to be the mother, trying to help out because Barak wasn't fully doing his job but she made the best of it and she she even went to him like look didn't god say you're supposed to go and when he said i'm not going unless you go she went with him and we see jail she's married to a guy who is making affinity with with the enemy of the lord yet she's and she didn't go off and and be loud and obnoxious and just, and just go and say, well, I'm going to get involved in this war and I'm going to go fight and I'm going to go kill him. But when it came to her house, when it came to her door, when, it, when she got involved through, you know, no, you know, it wasn't her own just trying to go and disobey her husband or anything like that. But when she's faced with a decision of, do I obey God or man? She did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. She, I mean, there's no doubt that what she did by killing Sisera was the right thing to do. No doubt at all. It was stamping out evil. And that wicked man from that wicked ruler, because that's why the Bible says, blessed above women shall jail the wife of Heber the Kenite be. 
She's blessed for doing that. That was a good thing. It was a righteous thing to end that guy's life. She chose to do the right thing in God's eyes more than to be concerned with what her husband would think about what she did. She put God above man. Now, I'm all for women being submissive and obedient unto their husbands as they ought to be, as the Bible teaches that they ought to be. But we always have to put the proper respect and authority on God because he has total authority over everything. And, uh, and we ought to obey God rather than man, no matter who that man is. But let's keep reading here. It says in Judges chapter 5, verse number 27, At her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay down. At her feet he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down, dead. Now, I'm just going to, we're going to turn real quick to Proverbs chapter 31. Because as I was mentioning, there's so much symbolism in Judges 4 and 5, especially with the principles that are taught regarding genders, you know, the women and men and leadership and things like that. The way that this is worded, again, I think is, is also important. Now, in the story, he just went in, went to sleep, and she killed him, right? But this is putting an emphasis that is saying, at her feet, he bowed, right? Now, I don't think when he went in, he's like worshiping her or anything like that. Remember, this is a song, but it's also teaching us at her feet he bowed, he fell. He lay down. At her feet he bowed. It mentions that three times that he bowed. And now he bowed, he fell. When he bowed, he fell. He bowed, he fell. He bowed, he fell down dead. And in Proverbs 31, we see the words of King Lemuel in verse number one. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, what my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. And again, I think that because there's so much being taught in these chapters in general of what's going on with women uh, leading and ruling, and even it being mentioned in chapter 4, hey, the honor is going to go to a woman. And it's being brought up as that's not a good thing that the honor of the battle is going to go to a woman over a man. Because the way that God intended it to be is that the man should rise up, the man should lead, the man is the one that should be getting the victory. And it's not to take anything away in general from the woman, but just it, it wasn't her role to be leading an army, to be leading the fight, to be leading the battle. Just as it's not a place for a man to be bowing down to a woman. Because it's not the way that God intended it to be. And with, again, tied in with Proverbs 31, um, the warning is here is don't give your strength unto women. You lead. Don't, don't rely on, on the woman to be the one leading. The woman's there to support you. God made and help meet for Adam to be a helper for him to do the work. Not for her to be the head. We all need to get into our proper God-given roles. And that is going to make us the most happy in this life because God made us and he knows what's best for us. But let's go back to Judges chapter 5. I just wanted to point that out. And again, the wording is, very, is here for a reason. Verse number 28. Now we're going to see another perspective, uh, another female perspective. And that's the, the perspective of Sisera's mother. Says the mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Her wise ladies answered her, yea, she returned answer to herself. She was saying, Why isn't he home yet from the battle, from the war? Because she's used to him coming home. She, they've been defeating enemies and everything else. Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey? To every man a damsel or two? 
to Sisera, a prey of divers colors, a prey of divers colors of needlework, of divers colors of needlework on both sides, meat for the necks of them that take the spoil. So you're saying, haven't they done this already? Haven't they just got the spoil, got his rewards? Why isn't he on his way home yet? Verse 31, so let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might and the land had rest 40 years. The reason why he's not coming home is because he's blotted out under heaven and, and, and um, you know, the wicked, this is their, 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 um, I apologize, man. My, <laughs> I don't know what my deal is tonight. But that they're, they're basically their children are going to be fatherless, right? You think about the, 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 the curse that came upon Judas and, and how the Bible says that, you know, uh, why can I not think of the verse? Anyhow, the mother is going to be grieving and, you know, the children are going to be fatherless and, you know, the wicked is going to live out half of his days. And that's what we see here with Sisera. And um, he didn't come home with the spoils. He was destroyed of the Lord. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great teachings that we can learn from, um, from your words, from the Bible. God, we thank you for... Um, the instruction that we can receive. Lord, I pray that you please help us to be able to take the time when we read through these stories to let them sink in and to, and to learn all that we can from the stories. Dear God, I pray that you please help us to be an encouragement one to another and help each other to stay in the fight, to stay in the battle, and not to succumb to the lusts of the flesh, but that we would walk in the Spirit on a daily basis. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.